This Sunday, we commemorate Memorial Day, we commemorate Pentecost. And one of my first experiences of Memorial Day was through my father. And my father was a stamp collector. And as he collected stamps, they were very beautiful stamps. And they were kind of impressive to look at, especially the ones from the Caribbean with all the flowers or different animals. But the one I liked the most was the stamp that was made, I think the year was 1948. It was about the four chaplains, and the ship was called the USS Dorchester. And it showed the faces of the four chaplains together with a sinking ship. And for me, that was such an inspiring story. You see, the people were told, the soldiers were coming over, this was 1943, from America to go to the European uh, conflict. And they were told, keep your life jackets on, because it's very dangerous. But they were kept down in a hole where the boilers were, and it was so hot, and it was, you couldn't sleep with the life jacket on. And when they got hit with the torpedo, all the lights went off. And there was a panic. And the ones who got the calmness were the four chaplains. One was a Roman Catholic priest, and he had served in the First World War and received a Purple Heart. Another was a Jewish rabbi. And then two were Protestant ministers. One had studied at the uh, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago. And they all had been in school together uh, at Harvard for the chaplaincy school. And when the ship got hit, they stood together. This is what they did. They handed out the extra light jackets. And the remarkable thing was this. The Jewish guy, the rabbi, did not say, who's Jewish? The Roman Catholic priest didn't say, who's Roman Catholic? And the Protestant ministers didn't say, you know, who's Presbyterian or Methodist or whatever. They gave it to the next soldier in line. And one of the soldiers, as he got his life jacket, said, oh, i got to go back to my room and get my gloves. And the Jewish rabbi said, oh, no, take my gloves. I have a second pair. But then the, boy, the, the young soldier realized the chaplain did not have a second pair. He was going to go down with the ship. They, after they gave out the last of the life jackets, they took off their own life jackets and gave it to the next soldiers. Then... They linked arms of the different faith expressions and they shared scripture, they sang hymns to encourage the soldiers in the boats or the ones floating in the water with their life jackets. And one of the people in one of the boats said it was the most inspiring thing they ever saw. Arm in arm, going down in faith, courage, and love. And it's such an inspiring uh, postage stamp. And they actually have a chapel at the Navy shipyard in Philadelphia in honor of them. Now, our very uh, closing hymn, the first verse is actually a song, a hymn that is sung at the Annapolis Navy Academy every Sunday as their closing benediction. When they close the worship in the chapel there, that's the song they sing as they dismiss. And underneath, the chapel is a monument where John Paul Jones is buried. And remember, he's the one who said, I've not yet begun the fight. And so it's like we remember these chaplains, their service, and we remember so many. And this week at Kaskaskia College, they had a special program where, where our Purple Heart veterans were recognized. And each of them could give a talk Mace Carpenter gave a great talk, and the key to his talk was that uh, we were so grateful for the families who support us. We had another soldier who shared quite a while about his experience in the Korean War. And then Roy Harris just got up and gave a very short talk. He said, uh, 6,000 uh, died on Iwo Jima, uh, 12,000 more got Purple Hearts, all 18,000 got Purple Hearts, and that's where Roy Harris got his Purple Heart and he was given a special quill given by a woman's group of the area. Each of these veterans received that. 
Also, during the week, the young man's. And are you saying, and we had Mace Carpenter talk, and we also had in the community Lori Aaron's talk. And so we had this great expression of gratitude for our veterans. And when, because we can worship here, we can worship in freedom because of what our veterans have done through the years, through their sacrifices. And, and they were deep sacrifices. I remember talking to Diana Brink's dad, Paul, Paul Lockwood, and then the end of, near the end of his life, he began talking about World War II. And he received his Purple Heart. His wounding happened in the Battle of the Bulge. So it was a terrible, terrible battle of heavy casualties. And he shared with me some of the horrors that he had seen in that battle. It was so, so hard. And so our soldiers have come through and served us so well. And as Dr. D. Boswell read in our scripture, Jesus says in, in John chapter 15, greater love has no one than this, that one lays down his life for his friends. And that's happened in times of war. It's happened in times of peace. And Jesus says, I'm laying down my life for you. You are my friends. And he has one commandment. He says, my commandment is, you gotta choose, it's a God thing, you gotta choose to love each other because those disciples were bickering, they were arguing about the most terrible things. They were actually saying, I'm better than you. James and John said, I'm better than you, Peter. Peter said, no, you're not. I'm better than you. And Jesus is going, no, oh, no. You've got to love each other. And in the church, in the family, there's always going to be some turmoil. I remember as a child sitting on a, a bed next to my sister and saying, isn't that terrible? We can't get married. You know, we're brother and sister. He's like, who's that much? But then another time, she's chasing me with the chair. So there's always ups and downs in every relationship. And perhaps your brothers and sisters wish they could have chased you with the chair. And that happens in life. It happens where we work. It happens in our homes, in our relatives. It happens at reunions. And it happens in, even in a church family. And the question is this. Am I willing to choose the love that difficult person? And for example, Wanda, our church secretary, had a group of church secretaries meet together for support. And she had a wonderful workshop that they all loved. And it was called, How to Get Along with a Difficult Pastor. So there's always the kind of things you can have to offer because sometimes we pastors can be very difficult. And sometimes, the parishioners can be difficult as well. And the point is this. Do we have the spiritual grace of the Holy Spirit to choose to love? Which means, I may say the same things, but I don't speak it out of anger or malice or resentment. I speak it out of love. Now the Holy Spirit, as we celebrate Pentecost, gives us some powerful things. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Peter says this, God does not give you a spirit of fear. In other words, if I go to a new challenge and I'm full of fear, that's not from the Creator. That's not from God. If I come with a spirit of being timid, that's not from God. What is God has not given us a spirit of being timid or fearful, but dynamite, dynamo, power. That's a Greek word, dynamo. You get dynamite from that. In other words, the spirit helps you become powerful. And there may be times when you have to confront an injustice. There may be times you have to confront somebody who's misbehaving and acting in a terrible, terrible way. But when you do it, you don't do it with malice. You come from that spirit of love. So you're powerful. And then you have the power of the Holy Spirit to choose love. Because sometimes you have to choose it, even in your own family. And they have to choose it to love you and me. So it's the power to choose love when you don't feel it. Like. And then, I love this one, and Presbyterians ought to really like this one. The last one is sound thinking. God gave us marvelous brains. Use them. Whether our students are going to apply to college or to work, whatever we're facing, 
use our heads. And Jesus says, which one would build a tower with the, without counting the cost? You had better count the cost to see if you could finish the tower. That's one of Jesus' parables. Another one, he uses a man going to war, but if he sees the enemy has many, many more soldiers, he better use his head and make peace. But the point of what Jesus is saying, use your head as you face the challenges of life. You go through life because of the Holy Spirit, with love in your hearts, with power, and using your own brain to face every challenge. The Holy Spirit has blessed us with its liberties and freedoms because so many people with the power of the Spirit have gone out and served us. People relied upon God to give us our freedoms and to protect us year after year after year. And our children used to sing a song that went like this. Love in any language, Jimmy and your daughter, let us straight from the heart, brings us together, never apart. Love doesn't push away. Love in any, any language, the final line was fluently spoken here. That's the key. And it says in our scriptures that Jesus says, if you abide in my love, you'll keep my commandments. And then he says, I tell you this because that's the secret of joy. I want more joy. Well, Ed, I better be more loving. If I want joy in my life, the loving is the door. Could I love the nature? Could I love the birds, the flowers, the trees? Now, could I spread it out a little bit? Could I love people? Could I love myself? Respect myself? Could I love God? The point is this. Could I be a loving person? Then comes the joy. Then comes the peace. I'd like to share uh, in closing on this day when we remark about Memorial Day. You know, we used to have gold, gold star mothers. We had one in our church. We had a couple, Dixie Griffin's mom, Thelma Thick. And when I came to bring Holy Communion to Thelma Thick, she showed me the quilts that she used to make with people in the church years ago. And then at the close of the time we had communion and sharing together, she took me to her living room, and on top of the TV was a picture, a picture of Jim Peck. He would serve in the Korean War and in World War II. Then she showed me the picture of another one. Another boy she had had during the war, the telegram person, you didn't want to see that person come to your house if you want to buy it. And they brought, they brought the telegram, your son has been killed. He was killed on the submarine, the USS Harder. That submarine had done spectacular work, and General MacArthur greeted them in Australia, but when they went out again, the ship never returned. And uh, there's a movie, Run Silent, Run Deep, kind of based, they say, on that particular ship. And so there is a tremendous cost, but it's the spirit that helps us continue to serve. And in my closing illustration, by the way, Thelma would have received a flag. I was given this flag. I did a funeral for a lady a soldier called Dixie. And she said, give it to that pastor in. I want him to do the service because he's the smartest pastor in town. And it's really funny. I was the smartest in town because she liked the slogans on the sign. This is like 25 years ago. And it was really uh, Darwin or Jerry Langan or Darwin. They're the ones that did it. But I didn't correct them. I just let them think that. You know? so sometimes sometimes you'll, you'll um, get honors you don't deserve. But I get plenty when you don't deserve too. So I, well, that's okay. But here's the illustration, and it comes from Dr. William Steiger. He was professor of preaching and homiletics at Boston University. He fought in World War I, and he really cared about the soldiers, and he visited soldiers in the hospitals. And here's a great story. And I close with this. But notice how the Holy Spirit helps our soldiers face challenges. It's called I Can Take It. And Dr. Steiger says, I was just getting off a Pullman card car in Newtonville, Massachusetts, and starting down the long platform with my bag, when a porter yelled to me, hey, mister, help this blind boy up on a taxi cab, won't you? I turned back, 
And there stood a blind boy in a soldier's uniform. He carried a typewriter, he carried a suitcase. I went back. He smiled and said, oh, I'm all right. I know this station. It's my home. I was born here. I used to fly up and down this platform. I'm okay. Don't bother. I'm just home from a hospital in New York. I got a crack in the head from shrapnel in Africa, and I guess I'm a bit blind. I looked at his forehead, and sure enough, there was a long white scar. The impact of that fragment of shrapnel had killed the nerves on his eyes, and he was blind. I got a strange shot out of that quick analysis and his explanation. But he was smiling all the time as if nothing much had happened. And he was utterly independent. He wouldn't hear of my helping him. I'm all right. I can make it. And what's more, I can take it, sir. Then he laughed. I could hardly believe my ears when I heard that boyish laughter. His mother and father didn't know he was coming home. I said to him, do they, do they know you're blind? No, they just know I got a crack in the head. I'm surprising them, for they don't know I'm coming. Well, I said to the boy, I say you're surprising them, son, and how I better take you home myself. I took him home. I helped him out of the car and carried his bags under much protest from him. His father and mother saw him coming up the walk and hurried out. When they saw his eyes, I thought both of them would faint. But he kept smiling all the time. They took him in their arms one by one. Nothing was said about the eyes, and I waited reverently. Then the boy turned to me and said, I can take it. I hope Dad and Mom can take it too. That was all. That was enough. I saw a grim smile on their faces, and then they thanked me for bringing the boy home to them. As I turned away, I heard him say again, to his parents. I can take it. Can you? That's what the Spirit does for us. Helps us overcome this and every challenge. Amen.